Good evening. Nice to see all of you here. So cheerful. Uh, let me tell you what the chronology of events will be. Uh, it's a little bit different than, than what we originally anticipated. Um, Jeff will be here in about 20 minutes, a half hour, just uh, having problems negotiating either the airport or the traffic. Uh, what we originally intended to do was to, was to have Jeff discuss uh, a competition for the Angevante in Vienna, which is a school that Wolf ran for how many years? 12 years, 10 years, 15 years? 20? <laughs> 20? Okay, for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and, and a school that, that is a distinguished uh, school of architecture, one of a few unusual voices in architectural education around the world. And in that context held a competition which could suggest the confirmation of the discussion that was taking place in the school for, for 15 years, meaning the result of the competition or the winners of the competition or the strategy that would be in evidence, a conceptual model that the competition would represent, would in a certain sense validate or ratify what the school had done or stood for or advocated for a number of years. It turned out that, that for reasons that, that we could discuss, why the competition was what it was, how it was done, how it was juried, whether it should have been done, all of that, the sort of political intersection or the intersection of, of politics with the design content of, of the project, and this is, this is certainly a topic. <clears throat> Kipnis's job was, was to go through the entries or the entries that, that he preferred and to talk about each one, not so much as a manifestation of what the entry represented in terms of its relationship to what the school had been, but simply in an abstract way, in a design sense, what the competition meant scheme by scheme. And in the end, I think to pick winners and losers and pick winners and losers based on the uh, supposition that what had been picked as winners and losers was not what should have been picked as, as winners and losers. And the title of his lecture um, was Why Bother? Uh, Why Bother, which sounds a little bit like uh, the title of a Kipnis lecture. But you don't know when somebody says, why bother, whether he's telling you why bother, meaning we shouldn't bother, or on the other hand, why bother, this is something that, that is really essential to us and to our cause, and in fact, we should, we should pay attention, and we're frustrated by the nature of the result. So uh, we, could, we could start out, we have about uh, 20 minutes or so to talk a little bit about the context of the competition, the leadership of the school, and, and we just pass it around and let, and let uh, Patrick you know, and Wolf you know, and Hernan you know, uh, to discuss a little bit about the context in which the competition was done, how it was done, how it should have been done, and so on. So you wanna start okay. off, Hernan? Yeah. I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, so, because we are kind of changing orders, um, I was planning for to start to, so they could have won why they lose, um, but because we're not gonna do that first, we're gonna start from, from kind of the end of what I was planning to ask these guys. Um, one thing we, that we were talking while we were working here, which I think especially for the students is, is important, because sometimes when we have, and Syriac has become in, a very frequent event, this series of discussions and marathon of two or three day lectures, it seems sometimes that some of the arguments get heated or get too frictional and confrontational. Um, one thing that I think is important to clarify is I think these are kind of inside family discussions. This is splitting hairs. It's important for everybody to understand that the enemy 
is out there. So I just want to clarify that because sometimes with this conversation, it seems that we go at each other's throat, and it's really kind of a familiarity. That's, okay, that's out of the way. So I thought that to start, there were one main point that I thought it was interesting for these guys to comment on it. And it occurs to me that with the exception probably of the Bauhaus, and maybe IIT in, in Chicago would miss, there are not many examples of a school of architecture in which the building has some kind of direct correlation with the ideology or ideologies that the school is supposed to represent. And it seems to me that this competition with all the political, cultural, ideological, intellectual thing in place, it was a kind of a unique opportunity to define the next 20 or 40 years of the school when the last 20 years was defined by intellectual and educational content. The next one, the building couldn't be a catalyzer to that, or not, which it would turn out to be. And I would like to open with that. I mean, do you think that there is a value in, in to have that, that architecture buildings, the school of architecture, the, the building of a school of architecture should have a direct reflection of what that institution produced on the intellectual level? It, that, it does matter, it does obligate anything, or it's fine that there is a complete disassociation between those two things? Are you asking me? I'm asking you, no, 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 yeah, it's partic you particularly to the German speakers first, and then the, Calif <laughs> the California representative can respond. I mean, I think it is an, um, great opportunity to have a school design its own space. And that opportunity was missed here, and it's really devastating in many ways. I mean, and I think that um, the school is unique in Europe, in continental Europe, precisely because it has a clear direction. There's a kind of curator, a dean, which doesn't exist in the usual university system, who, 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 can, who can forge a kind of relevant, coherent trajectory. And I think it would have been uh, great and, and meaningful and consequential if that same leader and dean or somebody in the working in the school or being part of the culture of the school would be able to turn that building into a manifesto of that coherent vision and trajectory. And I think to, um, the, that this has been kind of, the party has been spoiled, the opportunity has been, has been lost, it's kind of tragic. And particularly the, the, the project which was chosen I think was, I mean we were all shocked because it's a very weak and flippant gesture and substantial uh, kind of gimmicky kind of project uh, which really is kind of makes everybody cringe in the school that it should represent the school and, and be, be, be kind of usurpate that, 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 that um, institution. So I think that there is, uh, that's the situation we faced and I mean um, and as I said, so I think it's been, it's been a great opportunity and I think for the Bauhaus it's been in great, already the Wanderwelt Bauhaus and the Gropio Bauhaus. I mean the Wanderwelt, the precursor of the Bauhaus had that moment. Gropius said that moment, um, as he said, me said that moment and I think it, uh, it's, it's great, it's meaningful and could have been fantastic. Wolf? Yeah, I have to clarify the, um, uh, something. First of all, the Angewandte in Vienna is not an architectural school. It's an art university, so they say. Uh, we, um, the, the school has 1,500 students, art, sculpture, photography, education, whatever. Uh, things, uh, remodeling old things and and so forth. Um, um, the, the Department of Architecture only has 150 students. Uh, we have three so-called, or we had so-called master classes, um, which means 
that every student in this class is supposed to be a master. Not the master is teaching them, but the students are masters. Uh, we changed this um, system um, from ha having vertical studios, meaning that students could learn with Patrick and Saha and Greg and with me for five years or t uh, six years. Uh, we changed it to a master, um, no, how do you say that? Master, master system. Yeah, bachelor, bachelor master. Bachelor master system. Because, uh, because of the financial situation in Austria. This is, just to clarify, that it's not only an architectural school, but um, the Angewandte has an opponent in Vienna. Uh, this is the other art school, the academy. Um, and special the architecture departments are the worst enemies. Um, uh, we never ever, or I could never ever, get the uh, guys from the Technical University, which is the third architectural department in uh, Vienna, to, to get along, that we, uh, to get together to discuss how we could get along in terms of having cooperative competition. Uh, like, and now I'm in the deep uh, level of the Viennese culture, this is, uh, we, we never could get a solution in this, um, in this case. In opposite, it gets worse and worse. So um, it turns out that when we had a lecture, the Technical University tried to have another lecture at the same time, at the same day, and so forth. Uh, it never happens that I try to invite them to, for our reviews. <laughs> they never, never came. Um, uh, maybe you have been in, in the academy once. Or, uh, never. <laughs> so this is the situation. That's very important to know because, and I'm, um, um, Kipnis should have said, because you have to know the winner of the competition with the weakest project in the whole thing is the dean of the architectural department of the academy. So this is the worst defeat we ever can, uh, could get. And why it came to this thing, maybe Kipnis could explain that. But this is what I would say a good example for the reality in our architectural business. Meaning, I, I compared it always with an iceberg. What we are discussing in schools and what we are discussing in reviews what we are discussing in the architectural culture is only one seventh, the peak of the iceberg. The real driving forces, and maybe you could uh, learn that from uh, Patrick's lecture yesterday, the real driving force is the invisible architecture. And that means not only theory, which is very important, but also politics and all the cult uh, cultural restraints and constraints are very important for the outcome of the peak of the iceberg. I, I really don't know whether the students are interested in this invisible architecture, but I told my students, you better learn it as early as possible because you have to face that when you are in your uh, professional life. So what I can do today, and it, it will take me five minutes to give you an insight of the complication of a competition and how a major decision from mediocre people could influence a whole country or destroy a uh, whole cultural atmosphere. Meaning that never trust the system because the system is only that good uh, um, how 
the people are that work in this system. So we are waiting for uh, Jeffrey to tell you the story about the atomic bomb and um, Eric Moss's um, contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you want to add? Yeah, I, I can say something. I, I, first of all... <laughs> there was no doubt in my mind. <laughs> so why did you ask? Well, just being polite. <laughs> Good. Um, the, we do see uh, from, from America or from L.A. Uh, the Angevante, I think, in a somewhat different way. And, and Wolf gave an institutional definition of all of the pieces of the Angevante, which might be relevant in terms of the competition we did and the way we strategized about the building. But in terms of you and I, everyone who is sitting in the room, or in the AA, for instance, where, where Patrick uh, and Zaha teach, the school was an architecture school. It's an architecture school. It's about a profound discussion of architecture. And, and what, what Wolf did, which I think uh, certainly we should appreciate, is to change, is to completely revise what really was an autocratic system of, of discourse on architecture. Authoritarian, no juries, uh, people pontificating because of seniority and alleged professional status and changed it into something which, which is much more the model that, that you and I know and recognize in, in CyArk, for instance, and I think the, the AA similar, similarly. So I think a lot of credit has to be given to somebody who comes, it's, it's, it's for you, a given the context we're working in and the discourse we're involved in, you assume it. But if you understand it from a different vantage point, you don't assume it in the angevante. And I think the apprehension now is that it goes back to what it was before. Mm -hmm. So I think, it, I don't know that this will happen, but without somebody pushing, you know, the admonition that you need to understand the political context, and I'm probably not to get sooner or later. Um, <laughs> it's too late. Which one? You <laughs> Start talking. Okay. Set up, and we'll move to the original plan. Yeah. You want, you want to wrap it up that one, yeah. one, one other one other point about this what what Gropius did what the Bauhaus did what what IIT did to put up a model so this is worth thinking about to put up an ideological model we're talking about whether an opportunity was lost to make a building which represents what these guys did for 15 or 20 years. It's much harder to do that when you look at the context of the discussion that, that they were involved in. So it's not a certainty it would have worked, but it was an opportunity, I think, for sure, that was lost. You know what I mean? It's clear what the Bauhaus was, and the model of that is not so hard to represent. Uh, it's not so clear what the Angevante would be in an architectural sense, as was uh, unlike IIT. My idea when I did this lecture first time in Angevante is to, I don't do juries. I'm, I'm not very good at competition juries because I try to take too many things into consideration. I, I, don't, I can't keep my mind off of all of the factors, and so I just stay out of them. But, and I don't usually make, you know, don't usually intervene. But in this case, I thought it was a really interesting project. There were interesting um, entries. And so I did this lecture about my personal opinion about what I thought as a critic, as a practicing critic, was my assessment of the project. So just quickly, this is the building. And I, 
I gotta not go too fast. I know, just relax. I'm gonna calm down. The heck is now what? Because they were going around. So this is, there's the old building, there's the new building. I know, there's the, there's the, this is the kind of old timey building that, you know, there's two kind of buildings that are important. There's a new timey building and an old timey building. There's the school entry as it currently stands. And so that building on the left is that building over there. Okay, and this, you can kind of see the plan, although this is one of the competition entry plans. The basic idea was that the site between the two buildings was given to the competitors to, with the, to add classrooms and offices and um, you know, just a general expansion of the school. Now I'm just quickly, I, does anybody who know, know who this is? Who is Saab? Who, who is this, Wolf, do you know? Okay, this is one of the competition entries. Um, but in any case, we, okay, what you're going to see is that the competition entries generally fall into a simple category of, so that they, everybody hate, doesn't like the uh, new building, likes the old building because it's protected, and so you, they're working from the old building, the new building to the old building, and you can see it's a kind of how do you add to that old building. It forms a certain, certain typology, um, and, and it just gets more and more out, as you can see. Finally. It breaks away, and then there's two two entries. This is Holine's entry, which actually, in terms of its uh, basic basic and part T, is not that far from Wolf's entry. And then finally, there's this. Uh, this is a new. I forgot their name. Brave New World. I forget. <laughs> what is their name? What? Come on. What is their name? I'm sorry. Just help me relax a bit. Um, new. Come on, Wolf, what's their? Next enterprise. Next enterprise, thank you. Um, and then this is Eric's. And so you can see, I mean, I think from just a, from a quickly formal point of view, it's very easy to read the, uh, the, the approach to the project. It's pretty much good fine. Now, so what I wanted to start with, and I'll try to, I'm gonna cut all the jokes out so we can have a discussion. But this is where I begin my life in architecture, with this page and this book. Um, I think it's the greatest claim in history about architecture, architecture or revolution. Uh, it says that architecture has a political role. It says that it has an instrumental role. It also, we, we sort of make fun of it now um, as being far too naive. Uh, but I still think it is an, a worthwhile um, way to think about how we judge architecture in ways that are culturally significant as opposed to as service functions or in terms of uh, trite criteria like contextualism. Um, now, the key to this was Le Corbusier's view, and most of you have heard this from me a million times, it was Le Corbusier's sense that the ground was a place that could be changed from an instanti supporting instantiated power through it being land into something else. And in fact, he eventually produce a, a, an attitude about how to treat the ground so that it changes from land to datum. So the ground becomes an important issue and it will become an important issue in this. Uh, but it's not the only thing, but I just want to remind you that this is why we're here. This is why we're at this school. This is not why we're not at a service school or at an engineering school. Now, by the time of the mid 60s, the problem of the ground had left the question of uh, leaving the ground with Piloti or stepping off the ground like Mies van der Rohe did. So the whole history it became actually the whole idea of mobile architecture was a belief that um, the instantiated powers that architecture would like to form a resistance against were so entrenched in the ground that there was really nothing they could do, that nothing to be done. So Archigram, House Rooker, Co-op Himmelblau, uh, the whole architecture confable movement was, a, was really thought of as uh, mobilizing architecture so that it didn't participate in, those, in that uh, relationship. And that was an incredible period, I think, of invention and thinking. It was also as, it was almost as naive as the first ideas of Le Corbusier. But um, it was 
it had a radicality and it had an optimism and it had a direct understandability of what its project was about. And, uh, and so we celebrate that today. One thing I want to say as a, as a basis for this discussion is you cannot engage a rad radical project today or an adventurous or a speculative project today by quoting one from yesterday. The, the minute you quote, you're out of the possibility of any uh, political agency in the field. And so, you know, so you know all these slides. Uh, just quickly, I don't, you know, this was my one gag for tonight. This is called dental contextualism. Um, this is how to be a contextualist architecture, architect. And so here's the problem. So you got these teeth and you want to fix these teeth. And so you don't want a Peter Eisenman tooth. You don't want a Frank Gehry tooth. You don't want any of these guys are in this competition's tooth. What you want is that, okay? And so that is how you do contextual architecture. And so this is contextual, dental contextualism in architecture is this. Use the established type form, use the adjacency to determine height, use the adjacency to determine color, fill in any gaps. <laughs> so that's it. So there, what we become interested in is are there new possibilities to think about the context? And, and, and that's what I saw this competition as a little bit. Uh, one of the th another thing, I'm just standing here to tell you, because I'm in a bad mood, I, I'm sick of reflective glass as an architectural trick. It, it's, this is the end of it for me. This is uh, Odile Dex, uh, I, I can't even remember what it is. It's just about the dumbest building I've ever seen. Yeah. So she, cut, you know, she cuts the corner of an old building and reflects the old building around the old building to, I mean, it's just the worst kind of, you know, so I just, and the reason I'm attacking her is that she was on the jury of this thing, and I don't like her anyway. So I'm opening. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm openly announcing my opposition to everything deck. Uh, this part of the lecture, I probably I can come back to you. Want to? There is an insight in Wolfland's book on Renaissance and Baroque, which I think is a super important insight, precisely because it anticipates what is considered Freud's great thinking. Freud thought uh, when he saw, he went to study hypnosis with Charcot in Paris in 1900. He noticed that, that uh, people with real, hypno with real paralysis of the hand had atrophied muscles in their arms, whereas people that had hysterical paralysis in the hand that could re be relieved temporarily through um, hypnosis had no hysteric, had no atrophy in their arms. And so he realized that what was atrophied in a hysteric was not the hand, but the idea of the hand or the representation of the hand to the person's mind. And so it was a kind of breakthrough. Um, and what Wolfland noticed is that ba what, what we learn from architecture is how we understand our bodies in relationship to our mind, spirit, and soul. And that's what he argues in uh, Renaissance and Broken. He's very articulate about how Renaissance did it one way with part to whole relationships and how Baroque did it with uh, smooth connections and passions. And remember, he's analyzing it in the end of the 19th century work from the 15th and 16th century. And so by the time we're at Freud and by the time we're today, we're thinking not just in terms of the body, but also of the, the, the psychoanalytic or psychocultural way that we learn who we are, who I am, who you are, who we are together, and who they are. These are the questions that we are constantly being engaged in, and each discipline teaches, answers, teaches us answers to those questions in a different way. And that's what I look for in my architecture. I'm looking for architecture that has technological, formal, material interest, but in the end has a kind of a sense of project about it, about who we are, about helping me discover what I'm missing about myself. The beautiful thing about Renaissance is it taught us so much about part to whole relationships and proportions. It didn't teach me that my hand goes all the way to here, or it didn't teach me that when I'm afraid at night and want to run because it's a dark shadow, it, you know, it, it didn't teach me those parts of that. So I, other things have to teach me that. So I'm looking for that in the architecture. Now this was the winning entry. Uh, by Wolfgang Chapeller. I've known Wolfgang for a long time. He was actually the first architect from Vienna I met. He had just finished the Freud Library reconstruction in Vienna, which is kind of a funny project when you think about it, like to redo the Freud uh, studio in Vienna when there was absolutely nothing there. And it's kind of what he did. He kind of just left nothing there. And he did this really interesting, engaging project. But I mean, this is the best graduate student project I've ever seen. Beautiful drawings and 
incredible, but, but, but his effort to speak to the kinds of questions I'm asking you to speak to are based on quotation. So all of the balloons and devices and all of the architectural energy in this project are there for as a kind of invitation of history to come back and be active, but now in a playful way. And so I, I recall for you Marx's uh, tongue-in-cheek quote that history always repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce. And I think what you're seeing here is a beautiful farcical project. Uh, and it, it disturbs me a little bit because I want, I, I want you to remember something. This is the model of the project. Like this is the most accurate model of the building. Okay? And then this is the drawing. You know, they, they, and the reason for that is, is all of this stuff is supposedly going to be temporary and uh, or uh, uh, seasonally engaged. And by the time you do that, and by the time one understands the, the architectural adventure here, it will get valued engineered to nothing. So this is why I don't support the project, although this is why I actually encourage students to study this project, because there's some brilliant design in it, some wonderful thinking in it, and, and, but in the end, it produces no project. And by the time you do this, you're at the shiny thing again. Like, is this, this is not the, the sensibility I would like for the interior of my school? I think a better project was uh, Asymptotes project by Hani and Lee Zan. They have a similar attitude. It's a, it's a kind of fun house for students. But instead of using quotations, they go back and th there is a quotation. In fact, uh, uh, Holine's analysis of Biedermeier geometry is showing up in the hexagons. But there's a, a wonderful use of technology, very straightforward parti. Uh, the geometry is interesting. The containment is simple. He's removed from the other building. He opens up the court, or they open up the courtyard, the most of anyone except for the, uh, the wall buildings, which you're going to see. And so if you're going to pick one of the project, a project that sort of does what Wolfgang wanted to do, this is my, this is the better project. This is a project which uses contemporary technology and contemporary uh, approaches to co how one forms a, a community and how one behaves and misbehaves and, in a way that is current at the moment, and I think it's a really straightforward, very nice project. Say serious, what does that say? Serious fun, yes. Now, this is a Wolf Pricks and Co-op Himmelblau's project. Uh, I was quite disappointed with this project. Um, it, it looked very, it looked actually, when I first saw it, I thought it might be Holine. Um, it, has the, it has certain characteristics of Holine in it. Um, it does something quite odd for me, and that is for, for his 40-year adventure of showing whales jumping out of water and no gravity and no columns, this thing absolutely reinforces the ground in a very powerful way. And it seemed, um, I don't know, surprisingly conservative and outside of his uh, experimental project. And so, but as I can, and I've talked about this with Wolf, and I've come to understand this project more and more and more, uh, he did, and let me show you, I'll show you a bunch of, a lot of pictures. Wait, and all of these are probably not so bad. I probably could have taken it if it was, steel, but when it becomes this, then I get sort of disappointed. I mean, you know, the, because for, it's one thing to have glass uh, erase gravity, or, but to have grass, uh, glass become ground and reinforce ground, it, it's just a trope that I think is overused today, and I don't really see how it serves. Now, Two things I think I have to say about this project, which I've learned later on, and I don't think either of these changes my opinion, but they're really interesting to know. One is, it can be built immediately. And the politics of the school were such that it's likely that the project won't get built at all. If it, is, if it doesn't get built, the school could easily dissolve into another institutional form. Um, and so, to be able to be built, to work, and to be on budget was part of their tactic, part of their political tactic, not their design tactic 
But more importantly, the little piece on the top would, would require a fundamental change in the master plan in Vienna, something Wolf has been working on for a long time. He, it would open up the possibility of other architectures to the city in a profound way. Now, these are really important policy ideas, and it's really interesting that someone that close to the project and that um, you know, serious about his ro role in the city and not just internationally would make those part of the adventure of his work. However, I don't think it actually, you have to decide, I think you have to decide if you're gonna discuss policy or you're gonna discuss the architecture. And for me, it doesn't um, change my view of the architecture. One of the things I really love about Wolf is his desire for the old building to not be there. Uh, <laughs> You will notice that it doesn't appear, it appears in the model, but it doesn't appear there. <laughs> so this would probably have been a good, pretty good project. <laughs> and then, you know, it's... Uh, Jesse Reiser and Aniko Umamoto's project is a super interesting project. I mean, this is the kind of project that if you study, if you follow, as I do, certain practices, maybe a half a dozen practices or a dozen practices of a certain generation, in addition to the major practices that I follow, Jesse Reiser is one of the architects I'm most interested in. It's like very enigmatic, uh, formal work. It's, it's very hard to associate a discourse with his work, but there are little bitty things that happen in it, like, for example, the use of the, the the use of the mullions to create more arrays. But you will recognize this project as, a, as just an extension or on the research that in, occurred in the Sagaponic House. And I just don't, I mean, for me, it has no purchase in the school or on the site. So I'm not looking for buildings to be super meaningful. Had this been in Taiwan or, or Columbus, Ohio, or I mean, it, at a place that was already a no place, then it would be super interesting. But a place that's this charged, that has the history of Vienna, that has the history of this school, to simply uh, be disengaged about it, to treat this as a programmatic problem, left me flat. Although I think the, I think the drawings are quite nice. I'm kind of giving a capsule version. Okay, this is the next enterprise. I didn't actually have this project before, and it's pretty, it's pretty damn good, actually. It, it's a, it, it's a, it has one mistake. This, don't name your, when you name your things while you're working, keep it to yourself. So this is a really interesting form, and I think I can, uh, I can show you a little bit more about it. If you give me one second. Actually, the project is very good, it, but it is so, so there's the, there's that thing, but if you look, but see, this is the cafeteria and stuff. And so there's a, a if you look at the diagram, there's a great connection that they made between the old building and the new building, and they occupied the new building in an interesting way. But they call this the heart. And, so, you know, and it looks like a heart, so don't ever do that. You know, don't nickname your project so anybody can, you know, like talk about removing the heart. Uh, the project is so over the top that it's impossible to be, uh, to take it realistically. I mean, it's, it, in term, but I think if I'd known, seen it better, seen it before when I actually did, the, did this lecture in Vienna, I probably would have put it second. Um, I think it's a really beautiful, it has great attitude, it, it, it understands the history of Viennese architecture in an incredibly interesting way. It's very contemporary in terms of its attitudes about um, form and program, it makes wonderful connections, it's a lively place, and in particular, I think it's not afraid to fill up the courtyard. You know, I just thought, uh, now, I'm not gonna show uh, Patrick's tonight, because I heard that Patrick, uh, last night, did the entire history of architecture from beginning to end in real, <laughs> in real time. <laughs> So I assume at some point he might have, might have showed his, but it was a very straightforward wall solution, very similar to Tom Maine's. And to be honest with you, my sense of those two projects were, they were asked to come into a competition by a friend, they thought their friend should get the building, they wanted to do a credible job, they wanted to do a serious job, but they really didn't go for it. They really, that's, they held back. I really believe that, and I think you can see that in the work. <clears throat> I don't think everyone should have held, held back, I think, <clears throat> 
sorry. Um, it's your personal attitude. It was a stupid thing not to just give Co-op Himmelblau the building. It was just stupid, that simple. Um, not that I um, absolve Wolf for his participation in the stupidity. <laughs> uh, this is, <laughs> um, I would do a lecture later on about why the Viennese are such an irritating bunch of people to be friends with. Um, <laughs> They make it very difficult. <laughs> now, I actually, uh, this is a bit embarrassing for me. Um, last time I lectured, when I lectured on this competition entry in Vienna, I knew I was gonna trash Wolf, which was a bit, made me a bit uncomfortable. Now I'm going, I'm at the school that I'm teaching at and I work at now, and I'm going to actually say that my favorite project is the project by the director. Um, you, ha you heard my other lecture about the director, or possibly you did, so you know I'm not sycophantic, um, or that sycophantic. <laughs> I'm aware of my paycheck, but I'm not <laughs> stupid. And I have to tell you, I fell in love with this project from the first time I saw it when we were studying it. Um, there's something, it's also kind of not very Eric Moss. Um, but I, the thing I like, I want to call your attention to in the beginning is it, it starts with a nickname. It's up there on the top left. It says birds on a wire. Does anybody know what birds on a wire means? If you're my age and you liked Leonard Coyne, you might remember the song Birds on a Wire. But birds on a wire, birds on a wire is a metaphor for young, fledgling, youthful energy trapped and struggling to get free. In fact, it comes from the idea that in England uh, and in France, they would put lime on the, on the fences and attract songbirds. The songbirds would get stuck and would sit there and sing all day. Not singing, actually screaming for their lives, but it sounded like singing for the people that put the lime. So I thought, what an incredible view of students, that they were basically birds on a wire, trapped in a place for no reason whatsoever because they don't believe what's being taught to them and just dying to get free. And I, I don't know, from the minute I saw that, I really loved that. And so he's quite, you know, literal. I mean, these are the birds on the wire. There's the wire. Uh, I like the idea that elements that we've come to associate with an artificial ground and removing the ground as a piece of form from the ground now shows up as the wire. Um, whether you see that in Tom Main or, or uh, Stan Allen it has, a, you know, it, it becomes a device in which a certain sense of the ground is removed from the ground. And I think the idea that these things float between the two spaces and that they are provisionally balanced, this was the kind of project, the kind of non-gravity project I would have expected from Wolf. Something along, not, you know, not formally, but something along the idea that you really, uh, you attacked the ground of the school. Symbolically, intellectually, that you attacked it as an institution of certification. And you continue the tradition that he built there as the center of spec, as one of the great centers of architectural speculation in the world. And uh, I can't say I understand all these things. Like, I can't figure out where the red comes from. One thing I really like, and just for you students, you always start with an old project that you did somewhere else. Like, you I don't know if you know that, but that's kind of Kazakhstan. That's probably half a dozen Eric projects. Isn't that right, Eric? That little, and then you kind of work from that. And then you put a big red thing in to show that you understand the program. This is very important. <laughs> and that, that's the amount of program you need, and then you somehow make it disappear. It, and, then, <laughs> and then everybody, everybody knows that you, you're serious about it. Now, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, the things are beautiful. Uh, I don't know how realistic this is. I don't know how easy to build it is or afford. I do know that every time someone says to Eric, you can't build it, you can't, it can't be built, it can't be afforded, he does it once he's given a chance. And I also know something that I've learned from Peter Eisenman, and that is every architectural building comes in on budget. Sometimes it's the last budget, but it's, all, <laughs> it's always on budget. And uh, so, the, you know, it has a quality to it which I've never seen in Eric's work, which I could not get out of my mind as being Haydick-like. You know, it looks like the houses of the suicides and, and the, even the staircases. It has a kind of clumsy, non-tectonic, very clear 
almost metaphorical project, almost figural, and, and quite poetic, I thought. And uh, so those, those are the bridges that I, that, you know, you can, I don't, does, does that ring a bell to you? Does it strike you as being very John Haydick-like? Uh, and then it's got this, and the beautiful ground. And then I'll show you. There are some things that, that he mosses it up a bit. For example, the radioactive uh, Holocaust view. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he didn't want it, the whole Haydick poetry thing was just getting too much for him, so. <laughs> Which is now famous. And then, yeah, those, so those are the Haydicks. And these are the kinds of effects I love about John's work. So if you see these things, you, 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 you can't help but sing that again. Or if you see that, you can't. Like this is form work for a, Concrete pouring in Ohio State. Looks like a fantastic project. And when a project does that, it's not symbolizing a school. It's not actually doing what I, if I got, if I made a guess of what you were talking about, it's not doing what uh, the Bauhaus was supposed to do. It's not stating a symbolic case for the school. It's setting into motion a host of architectural effects that might belong to the intention, might not. It will outlive any interpretation. One thing I can tell you for sure, it will outlive, it would have outlived any interpretation uh, because of the de degree of its sort of poetic ambiguity. Um, I love things that are like, like high serious art that with just one little trick become, it's very difficult to see David Smith again after he said, I actually think John, uh, in the project. Now, I showed this to begin with, the reason I show it again is you see these four guys, um, these are my favorite public art in the world. Um, and I don't even like the artist at all, and now I've forgotten his name. Franz, Franz West, oh yeah. And these are, they're called the Lemmers, and they were, they were put up by Peter Nerva, they were put up for six months. Um, everybody in, in Vienna hates them, they're, it's right in front of the stop park, so they scare the tourists away. They look, they really, look at them, I mean they got, yeah. Plus, at night, they're heavy, but if the wind blows and there's a storm, they turn and they change directions. So, so, but they are, these are birds on a wire. And I actually cannot help but think, <laughs> we'll survive any war. Okay, that's it in the short version. Thanks. I tell you what happened after the announcement was done in, in Vienna. The guys from the academy called me up and said, okay, you guys always say you are the best architects of the world. You and your friends, Saha, Patrick, Tom Main. Now see who won. <laughs> yeah, Wolfgang is from the Yeah, Yeah, the, yeah this, I told it before. Oh, you did, okay. Yeah. And the other one was that I got a call from the Department of City Planning of, of Vienna, who said, this guy, I know him very long, he is an idiot. <laughs> but uh, he is kind of, uh, um, how do you say, neurotic. He's not educated as an architect, but he's educated as a geometer, but he, thinks he knows about architecture. He called me up and said, why do we always invite foreign architects? You could see at the result, they never would be able to build in Vienna because they have no idea how to build in Vienna. Uh, and I tell you what, and this is a very personal, it's a very personal remark. We built up together with, I was trained on SIAC, so to say, as teacher, and I brought the review to Vienna and whatever, so. So this decision done by a stupid jury, by, led by a stupid guy who is not an architect at all. He is maybe an illustrator of, of ideas, former ideas, which was very important in the 60s. This, Peter Cook is his name. Uh, so what I say at the beginning of the window. <laughs> no, no, no. So Just to clarify. He had no idea what's going on and, and, uh, and he was accompanied by two very untalented architects as well. 
two ladies, I have to say. And anyway, so, and there were bureaucrats in the jury. So this jury destroyed 10 years of intense working against the bureaucracy of Vienna. It's not only my, 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 my kind of um, uh, ambition. Uh, the, I was supported by Patrick, by Saha, by Greg, and all my friends coming and giving lecture. So this is a very, very big disaster for the architectural development in Vienna. You will see that in five years. I always said it's not because I uh, left the school. It's because the mentality of bureaucracy took over. Um, it's sad to say. And what Jeff discussed was the kind of ideological projects which for sure would have been looked different if Eric would have um, got the first prize, I swear you. It would, it would look so different, you, will not, you would not be able to recognize it. Because the codes and rules in Vienna to build, they are not complex. They are very complicated. Because the mentality in Vienna, and therefore we don't have really good buildings in Vienna, the mentality in, of the bureaucracy in Vienna is the first argument all these guys are bringing, if you are in a discussion, say, it's not possible. So you have to understand what that means. If someone says to me, a high-ranked bureaucrat who decides master plans on Flächenwidmung and all the codes in Rosenberg, why do we invite people, foreign architects, they don't know how to build in Vienna. It's, it's done by a jury. Yeah? It's, this is fixing all the things we fought for 40 years in Vienna. Therefore, I'm really, really mad about this whole procedure. Not that I didn't win is, uh, is the, the reason I'm so, um, um, uh, so, so, so disappointed and aggressive. It, it means a lot for the political, architectural, political, the invisible architecture in Vienna. So it doesn't help if we discuss the issues of how intelligent the concept is if the guys in the reality could say it's not possible to build. That's the, 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 that's the invisible, terrifying aspect of this I, I, competition. Uh, you have, uh, I'm going to have to just attack Wolf. Uh, I'm going to have to attack you. <laughs> um, I, I, I know a lot of blind critics. Uh, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> the you, the questions of the policies in Vienna and the questions of a competition entry, you mix things a lot. Like when you were talking about the stupid idiot in the jury, I thought, well, was David Chipperfield on that jury? You know, like yeah, almost. <laughs> no, but I mean, you you pick. And I want to get, and I also want to direct this to um, Eric. Have you published your five points of Cyark yet? <laughs> yes or no? They're published on t shirts. Are they really? Yeah. You got all five on you one t shirt? I want to buy one, $18. But is it like to for you, To you, $70. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but 19. I mean, t shirt. But well, the last <laughs> one is architecture has. Needs its enemies, is that right? Needs, needs an, an enemy. Needs an enemy, and only one. Wolf believes this. Um, the Bauhaus argument sounded like it. You, you know, this is. I don't have enemies in architecture. I have indifferences. But we live in a world today, and in fact, Freud says the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And that the, so the mobility of architecture, the numbers of possibilities in architecture are such that you can't actually identify an enemy and have it do you any good whatsoever. 
All it does is let everybody else run free. You know, and so when you take, when you try to do a project and address the enemies at the level of policy in the question of a design, you're going to fail. Whether it's an international jury or not, you are going to fail. Um, and you're, you're going to fail with... Sorry to say, no, no. Let me like, finish my point. I came out here pissed mm -hmm. off. I had to provoke somebody. I'm going to provoke you. Um, like the, the, David, the David Chipperfield thing is just in, nutty. Just nutty. He's a blithering idiot. You don't need to tell the world he's a blithering idiot. There was a lot of great work at the Biennale. I don't know, I'm sure in the, in the whole history of the world last night. But Jeff, hold Pat on, hold on. Last week in a debate, an American politician, borderline idiot and liar, did that. The president chose not to and see what we are this week. So I'm not so did sure. You hear the debate? I was I'm not so sure sometimes yeah, you don't no, need to point mis in. I just I, completely I, misunderstand it because I, I didn't attack Chipperfield, I attacked the, the topic. I, I understand. The topic. The As if the fucking topic what matters. He said, no, 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 no. What he said, he said that uh, the architects are in a bad role because they don't compromise the real way and they are too resistant. So what should I tell my student if I read that? Tell him to go to the Biennale and see Patrick's project. It was a, it, it, you know, I had stuff in it. I'm really proud of it. I saw a lot of stuff. Yeah, okay. Patrick did a, a, an absolutely defining project. You, whether or not you like the tree form or not, I'm sure he showed it to you last night. But the integration of robotics and parametrics is now saving what was about, what had already been called dead, and that was the parametric style movement. So, I mean, it's a, it was a, you know, you, and I walked through the Biennale, I saw brilliant work all the time. Yeah, but it, we, are we getting a little bit confused? No, here. I'm just, I want to. Nobody knows what we're talking about. All I'm saying is we have, a lot of the conversation us. tonight is, you got to know your enemy, whether it's the master planner. No, no, no. Or the but enemy, wait a minute. Or David wait, wait a minute. Field, wait a minute. Or yeah, you? I, yeah, I'm not your enemy. No, no. But your your <laughs> claim that we need an enemy. No, but it, it, this is a this is a conceptual idea. It doesn't mean you have to because you don't like Romney. This is not a political discussion. It has to do with the content of what you're doing, and it seems to me so. This we could discuss. If you want to move the discussion of architecture, if it's not, it's not a fixed state, it's not a steady state, it's moving, it's not, it, it, it's not static. And if you're interested, it will move. And the question is, who moves it and how does it move? And the entrenched point of view, the way that becomes the way, meaning allegiances, affiliations, rules, whether it's Philip's book and it says, you want to be a modern architect, kid? Mm -hmm. Flat roof, ribbon windows, piloti. There's another argument, which is that the teacher ought to be saying, don't do what I do. Take me on. Take me on. Because whatever the, this is my hypothesis, so he would disagree with that. But, but if, if, if you say, this is the way out of, out of a certain, what, what he referred to last night as a chaotic, he's talking about what he called deconstruction and the interrelationship of pieces, and then they're not precisely described and defined. Is this is an interest, whether this is, whether this is true or not, which became a kind of formulation, a way of making imagery, and after a while, radical, not thinking, but repetitive, imagery in the form of something that is already a little bit tired, it became a rule system. And I'm just saying, I think what you have to try to do is you have to try to move that out of the way. But it won't move very easily. What Wolf is talking about, he's talking about a political, I mean, what do they want to do in Vienna, really? They want to they retain what they have. They want to retain what they are. And however they stratify the regulations, it's designed not to do anything but what they already do. So if he makes a project which lifts something in the air, mm -hmm. which you can't do, so this is, this is whether he did it artfully 
whether he did it no, in, a, in, a, in a poetic way. You have to get that too. But the poetic way is also addressing the kind of sameness or homogeneity which is particularly entrenched in that city. And when people say to him, you can't do it because you're bringing in people who don't understand it. Actually, they do understand the people who come in. The people who come in understand what you don't understand. Guess what? That's why we brought them. So if they bring Patrick, or they bring you, or they bring Tom, or they bring Jesse, whoever they bring, they're looking for a voice, he's looking for a voice, which will turn the context around. You have to do that. It's very hard to do, and even if you do it for a little while, sometimes you do it, this is what we were talking about when, when you're screwing around in the airport, that the building might have confirmed, or the limo, or the traffic, uh, yeah. <laughs> The building, no, if, if they make the building, you could say there, there are probably four or five projects that would have, would have done it, and you can argue the difference. That would have ratified an era in a way, even if they turned the school back over to these other jokers. But the presence of the building and the strategy of the building would stand as an adversary for all of the things that, that, that are not only repulsive in Vienna, but create these kind of fascinating tensions with Canetti's and Schoenberg's and all of these guys who run away and run back, you know? So there's something about it which is, which is magnetic. And this, this was an important moment for schools and for that school and for that city. And for whatever combination of reasons, we failed to, this is the enemy. And the enemy is particularly entrenched. This is why LA is so different, you know? This is indifference in LA, which is, which is in, in many ways, uh, uh, it's a difficult situation, but it's a different kind of situation. You know, you have to look for an adversary. Oh, you want to do that? Do it, you know? It's different here. And to mix the two cultures, which happens, you know, look at a building in LA, look at a building in Vienna, and you put it on, you put it on the cover of Fudagawa or something, and mm -hmm. you, you extract, but they're, they're very different. So this is, this is the, this, the architecture does need an enemy. Okay, but uh, the title of the thing is Why Bother, so I'm gonna try to bother to add to something to this, but this also, what you guys have mentioned, um, the, comments and so on, also it's kind of scary. I mean, if an intellectual project of architecture is so fragile that a small expansion of a building can shut down such, a, such an intellectual project, we are in trouble. So in that case, I mean, if we need an enemy or not, uh, that is, is to be discussed. But in that case, we need to, um, we need to get other weapons. I mean, we need, we need to get more stuff in our arsenal because it seems to me that it's too much of an easy defeat if, I mean, the fragility of such an intellectual project in a school like that, it relies all on the line in one thing. It's kind of a dangerous, I mean, we are in a very weak position yeah. uh, as, a cultural, yeah. as a cultural discipline, not as a service capital thing. I'm talking about the cultural intellectual capacity of architecture. So in that sense, I mean, the, the question at the beginning was if a school of architecture needed to produce a building that reflects the ideology that the school teach or not. Okay, that was what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, if the case is, okay, we, we sort of agree one way or another that that was an opportunity, but then if the forces had been, I just, I mean, I'm just trying to raise, I mean, the, the intellectual fragi fragility, no, not intellectual fragility, the kind of a political fragility of an intellectual project of independence, the avant-garde radical thinking resistance, is so weak that at the end of the day, we're talking about an expansion. It's not even a self-standing building. If that can trigger I, I have such to say, a... I know I have to say these guys all have a great thing. I just want, it's, there's a paradox in it because there's, there, there's something particularly wonderful about doing it in the, in the context of a, of, of, of a proposition which is so difficult to do. And part of the problem with a lot of contemporary architecture is it's, in the end, it looks like what it used to 
be supposed to look like when it was difficult to do it, but actually it's not. Exactly. So, so it, it, but the, wait a minute. When uh, when this guy sent me a, an an image at four in the morning of this, of this thing, you know, the, whatever it is, saying? yeah, and, and I'm looking at this thing. It makes everybody feel great, actually, because because. The exception, the exception is never going to take over and be the rule. Right. It won't do it. No, and maybe, look, when we, when, when we came to CyArk, Ming and, 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 and I, we, we had a discussion, should CyArk die? It was interesting for a period of time. It did something that was unusual. Maybe we should let it go. And maybe it's some, we decided not to for a lot of reasons, but, but maybe this is what needs to happen to the Angevante at the moment. And, and in, in a paradoxical way, what it did and why it did what it did doesn't go away, actually. But what would have confirmed it would have been the building. Um, it, it yeah, does, but, uh, okay. I, have to, yeah. I have to say, uh, I don't need enemies. The, uh, no, I don't need enemies. I have it. You have enemies. Yeah, because, uh, <laughs> and we all For have sure. it, yeah? <laughs> this is a big difference. And you don't know where they are sitting. They stand up in a, in a political situation like now, also in, uh, in, in, in Austria. They st the mediocrity takes over. So they were quiet a long time, but now they stand up, and they, if they kill someone, all the others, they are happy. Peter never had to leave. He was fired. He was an exceptional museum director in Vienna. He was fired. Peter, hang on. Yeah. Let's just be honest. Like you, Peter Nerva also made it possible for him to be fired. He had his self-destructive instinct, which is so yeah, but this is vital to the my Viennese dear friend, psyche, my dear friend, made that possible. This sounds very opportunistic in my Viennese ears. Yeah. I don't, anyway, it, it, you didn't it, have it, to resign. You, you know, the, if you go, I, I disagree. Yeah, let me, let me go is, through all the premises. We I disagree to, with the no, fragility of the idea. I disagree with the Jeff, need that Jeff, mine was not an affirmation, it was a question posing of you. Let me ask Is you a question. Fragile? Can I ask you a question? Is that fragile or not? Can I ask you both a question? I think uh, Bernard's t tenure at Columbia for 12 years was remarkable. It was a bit, bit good yeah. luck. It was, by the way, nothing he believed in. Just we should be honest with each other. All of what happened at Columbia and what he fomented and what happened at that and so many people who came out of that um, was not really something that was his own ideas, his own thinking. He didn't do it. He never did do it. Never started to do it. And and then, he, do you think the Learner Center at Columbia confirmed that? Had anything to do with that? I don't think so. More importantly, it was the death of it through Mark Wigley, the rapid immediate, um, intensely brilliant disassembly of it, which has now put it into our psyche. We, I, I see constantly, uh, you know, books about Columbia, discussions about the period of Columbia. The Russian constructivist movement, so, where's Dora, I need some dates, 1914 to 1920, okay? 1914 to 1920, not one building. Uh, we are still working through those problems. So I just don't believe that the world of architectural ideas works the way you, I think the role of building is very important, just like I think the role of the performance of a composition is important. But I think the ideas and the history are in the composition and the context, and it's, uh, that's where the culture lives. And so that's why I said, I think Wolf should have done two things. He should have put forward an entry which said, we are not going to do this building until we change the policies in Vienna. Just that. You don't mix the building with the problem of the policy. And I, you know, I just, for me, I keep, this is what I keep saying. There are really interesting problems, and you are probably more expert. I mean, I, you know, you know that he's constantly, like the column that comes up at Puzan that doesn't have to be there. I mean, he can solve any kind of problem. 
Um, but he, when we start to think that the building is going to carry our ideological flag for us, is going to do the work for us, we are seriously mistaken about our effectiveness in the world. It's, the, it's actually the discussion of the building after the fact, whether it was built or not. I mean, you know, Milnikov, how many buildings, you know the most, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, the most vivid built building by Melnikoff in the world is the RCA Music Hall in New York, which he came and consulted for after he did the uh, Sleep Hotel. So he was the consultant on that one building in New York. No one knows that. Uh, and so I just, I think we should teach the importance of the building. We should teach the importance of this. Life. We should teach short-lived, the short-lived nature. I mean, from Renaissance to Baroque is 24 years. From 19, I mean, Periods in architecture tend to be between 15 and 25 years and have not changed. So our problem now is the prolifer, we're, we're really on the verge of going into the, I think the disastrous situation of contemporary music or pop music or non-classical non music in the sense that it is so easy to proliferate. The technology is so easy that there is nothing anymore left but short-lived interest, no discourse no history, no memory. You know, it's just now everybody buys, buys Ableton, and when people figure out that Rhino is easier to use than Ableton, then watch out, because it is easier to use. And I, I just think... Uh, yeah, uh, Jeff, uh, happiness. I know, I know, I know these argu arguments very well, and I remember the talk with Derrida when he said even a Sometimes a little sketch is more influential as the biggest building. But I also I think if we only talk in architectural terms, only architecture will come out. I imagine I saw yesterday Slash playing Sweet Child of Mine. <laughs> yeah? He was playing a fantastic guitar. Who was? Yeah, Slash. Slash. Oh, Slash. Slash. Yeah, he was playing a fantastic Slash. guitar. If someone would have plucked off the power, <coughs> no one, really no one in the rock and, ho rock and roll uh, fame of Hall, <laughs> no one would have heard him. So if you were not able to publish your thoughts, what would you do? And I think my point of view is, I really like to build my drawings. And I'm going for it. And I figured out and I experienced that I have well, to do politics as well. Let me ask you a question. So not only discussing the peak of the iceberg, but showing the, the it's, it's, also, it's also very, very good for the young, our young colleagues to, to tell them the experience we made so that they can avoid or find a new strategy to overcome these idiots. Our enemies. You're right, you're right. The mediocrity. Uh, the, 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 why isn't your Argavanta competition on your website? On my website? Yeah, when I went today to look up some you more... Mean, you mean in, uh, on which website? When I go to Co-op Himmelblau and it says enter oh, site. So sure, nice. And I look for... Why not? <laughs> why not? No, because okay, you, I you can tend tell to you, put and you mentioned build it. buildings. Yeah. You tend to put, you're more interested in build, your built buildings than the effect of your work. And I, I, I love buildings. Uh, you know, but, yeah, but buildings you don't judge, do the job. Yeah, you can judge, you never can judge a building via rendering. That's true. So you have to step in, you have to walk around, because you need time. Time is a very important factor. That, that, that makes your audience research. about 6,000 people a year at best. What? I mean, what you're saying, look, Beethoven was deaf. He looked at people's scores. I mean, you know, this is such an old argument. If you're a composer today, you, you never hear your music. You write music, you send it to other composers, they read the music, they understand what you're doing, they understand yeah. that. You got no chance whatsoever to actually ever hear your music performed, none. Yeah, the, you know I think uh, architecture is not only the internal discourse. I that's mean, true. You are only within the internal discourse, that's but true. there are some. That's where I. Some of us who, 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 who live and breathe in that internal discourse to 
transport it outside, make an impact, and change the physiognomy of the built environment globally. And for that point, uh, it's important that some of these ideas get built. They, they get built in, and I agree, internally it's nearly the same, but only nearly, whether you have a fantastic project, uh, competition entry, which was never built, and makes an impact and carries on. But some of these fantastic projects need to get out there, get built. And that's where modernism built itself up with, with the Villa Savoir, with the um, Barcelona Pavilion, and builds on that and builds, rolls out then and transforms the, uh, the physiognomy of the built environment globally. And I think we, and, and institutions are extremely important. And, and I think they are fragile. And that's, I was talking earlier about the importance of dean and leadership and, and vision and curating and coherent uh, educational research enterprise, which is, exists here, which, which is uh, Wolf's achievement at the Angewand, and it's in continental Europe the only one. And they are fragile, and you can see it with something, what happened at Columbia, what, how important it was, how it developed a, a movement, gave space, gave exhibition uh, space, g gave uh, you know, um, the, the possibility to build talent. And I think that is very fragile, but I do believe at the same time that um, there is enough, uh, those people who were formed at Columbia then spread out and went elsewhere and re reseeded and rebuilt. But it's, it remains something to be fought over. And I'm, I think um, yeah. I'm worrying about capturing and recapturing some of those institutions, powerful institutions which has been, have been lost because the project I'm trying to Build and as we are participating in is is in the last five years didn't progress as fast as we were hoping it could uh, uh, four or five years because of the, the recession. There's a kind of delay and setback, and losing Colombia during all this period is a kind of means a delay and a setback. Losing Vienna means that the whole, that Austria and continental Europe is kind of. Uh, uh, losing I momentum. You, I, want you to and I think it's, to his it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's problematic for me. Isn't it the exceptional building which does the work rather than a new building dominant culture? You argued that it's the, ex the exceptional, you know, the building that's confronting us with what we're not doing as real as possible, as functional, as appealing. And then when you see it there, and it's nowhere else, then you are aware of the degree to which you are suffering the uh, uh, onerous weight of habit, custom, and, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we have to be a little bit careful not to do too much Salvation Army self-pity for architects, you know. Well, I mean, the people at the table are doing okay, and they, 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 they're saying in many ways what they're also arguing is difficult to say. So the lesson is it's, yes. it's important to understand that people who are, who are making legitimate points about the difficulty in the opposition in the bureaucracy and the mediocrity have also figured out ways to, to, to dance between those obstacles, at least from time to time. So, so it's doable. And I think, I think the exception, I mean, what's interesting to me is it, the exception is important. I just want to make sure that the exception continues to be exceptional. At least that's the aspiration. And it doesn't fall back on a kind of, uh, on a kind of we know how to do this. I guess, you know, this is, my this, model this is, is uh, one more, one, yeah, one more thing, it, because uh, it, it's picking up on what, what uh, Patrick said. A lot of this depends on who you think is the constituency for architecture. Yes. Who are you talking That's to? Exactly. I mean, exactly I know right. by the time by the time Wolf and Tom and I and you and Stephen, it's a, how many times are we going to sit on a jury? You know, it's sometimes it's a little bit too much backslapping and 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 so on and so on. It's collegial, and I think that's important. And we've shared a lot of things. And sharing those things and living through those things are, are essential. But you, but you have to remember what your obligation is. And it's not only to talk to your friends. You either have to, you either have to, you have to talk to a, a, a very different group of people 
or make what's available or what you have the capacity to make available based on energy, based on organizational strategies, based on talents, based on will, based on insisting, to make, to, to spread it, to stretch it, rather than just sitting on juries in, 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 in SIARC or the AA or the, those things are important. So I think when you talk about building, you're also talking about stretching to, a, to an audience, yes. to a constituency that might not know you. But or don't you think? You have to do that, I think. That's how the discussion moves. And therefore, you're, t you're touching people, or talking to people, or involving people who aren't reading the autopoiesis of something. They yeah, don't I mean, need I think that's why I like the Wolfland's model, that the work of buildings in the world is incremental. It takes a long time, happens psychologically, happens almost unconsciously. No one remembers when all of a sudden the hand became this. Yeah. It's the work of language. Um, the work of the discourse... But you can't control, that's something you I can't agree. control. I and, agree. And, and obviously some of it is very quick and cultures are different and responses are yes. different and the time of response is different over funny. long periods of time. If you want to go and I remember wandering around Istanbul and, and, and this Sinan whose work I didn't know and sending the name around as they sent it to this guy like who the hell is this guy? Built 500 of these things. Not still didn't get too far from Istanbul. It's been 500 years. You know, so you don't know how, and on the other hand, somebody makes something in, in, in Incheon or Guangzhou, and it's, it's, it's all over the place. Um, Patrick, um, because I think, Jeff, you have to leave like in five this, minutes. I have to say, this so sucks. I just can't even um, think so, I, no, I, I got 30 minutes. You have 30 minutes? Yeah. I mean, okay. you know, we don't have to stay like, for 30 no, minutes. No, I just said, no, if you have 30 minutes, because if not, I thought it would be good if somebody no, no. wants to ask something no, no, I, before I, we I, keep I, talking. I just would you. like to add a very personal remark uh, for me. You know, when you showed all these images yeah, of the models, especially the model of Next Enterprise, yeah, which were students from our school, a long right? time ago, yeah, yeah, they were students of my, my, my class. I really wanted to see that built. But it's impossible, it's really impossible because there are so many codes and rules, ruled by bureaucrats, not by intelligent people. They, they try to, to get over these rules. You could do that, yeah? And we have to fight these guys to push them back, <laughs> to push them back in the holes where they come from, <laughs> just, just to, to be, be free to do so. I, I know how, I personally know how tough it was to get the library, your library in Vienna, through the jury and through all these things. This was a, a terrible fight against all enemies. Yeah, and we won. Finally, lucky, whatever. Strategic, very clever, but we won, yeah? And Eric, oh, some of you. disasters, disasters um, academy would be a really very important um, contribution to the architecture in Vienna. But it's, right now, it's not possible, on, and it, in the next future, it will not be possible because of this disaster decision. And I swear you, Wolfgang's Chapella's um, project after, uh, we, how do you call it, a value engineering? Yeah. It will be, uh, look like an uh, insurance. Yeah. Okay, Plus, so, that, that, so, so, any questions? We have to get through that. Why not? Wait, did you read that thing I told you to read? Okay. Um, if I understood correctly this whole discussion, if I understood correctly this whole discussion is that it seems that against architecture there's an enemy to a certain extent that is not allowing us as, as future architects or architects to do what we want. So the question that I ask is, do we, I mean, spe especially that I'm a student, specifically that I'm a student, do we teach students, the next generation of architects, to be aware of, the, of such things 
as a primary, um, how to say it, structure within the, the discipline. So we know what we're up against in the future. Because you say, uh, Wolf, you say uh, that these guys don't know what we're talking about. They, they're not architects. So, but they, yet, yet they're out there, they're, they're dominating the, the cityscape. So as, as future architects, isn't it your job to teach us that? But we, it doesn't exist within schools? I've never seen that anywhere in the world. Like how to fight that. <laughs> you will get bored after five minutes. Yeah, until, yeah. This is not the, what, what we tried to do, and what we tried to do, whatever we tried to do in the, in the school in Vienna, we tried to, to tell the students, you make craziest thing you can imagine, research on any level, follow Patrick to the end, um, Patrick to the end. But you have to think, you always think that you want to build it. Otherwise, it's an academic discussion, which is OK. But sometimes I think, OK, it's my point of view. Sometimes I think I always wanted to step into my head to see whether I was correct or not. This is, this is, um, this is a, you know, space you cannot draw. You have to experience with time. And you have to walk through the space in order to know whether it was worth to design it. You know, just to quote um, um, Patrick, when I was, the first time I saw the Maxi Museum of Saha, I really was smashed because I never ever could imagine the quality of the space from the rendering or from the drawing. I always hoped it will uh, work out very well, yeah? And finally, they got it. But it was, it has to be proved by three dimension. So this is what I say. And but now would you want I'm every building in the world that you walked into to be incredible space? Not every building. <laughs> I mean, my problem is. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, what me, you I have two problems. One I don't is, think we're in any rigs that they were having. I don't. So. But live. I once. So my last. Mother. The last thing I wrote about Danny Liebeskind said, "I have to admire a world that will that can build his work or be more interested in his work than I am." Like, he's building everywhere. He's doing. I don't like it. You know, I like the him. I like to think about it. All you guys are building a lot of stuff. You know, as long as as long as you don't want to be world making, which he does, I understand. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna isolate the world making guy and discuss it in a second. As long as you are trying to show There's something appealing about that too, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because in the end, to yeah, be on, to be honest, in your office. the answer, yeah, the answer. <laughs> but the answer, the answer to this guy. I mean, Wolf is wrong when he says you you follow Patrick to the end, because we don't need more guys following Patrick to the end. Maybe chasing Patrick. This is a little bit different. You know, because following Patrick means Not it's chasing, overtaking. Overtaking. But, but they're very because because he 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 confuses the writer of his book with the readers of the book. Well, no, the, the readers the are reading. chanting the book. The, yeah, this is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> it became a religion. So so this is this is not necessarily the answer to dealing with entrenched political social difficulties to follow to follow i mean every every student every person has to make certain choices everybody won't make the choices people here made and even these are not the same choices you or wolf or or none or whatever they're different but but i think if again if you want to move the discussion you will have adversaries and it's not clear how you teach people how to deal with adversaries. You know, like this guy, his, his dream is to work for, don't get insulted, uh, but his dream is to, to redo the donut of Google or dump it, you know? And, and, but, but Google as a kind of mega force 
in 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 the in in the determination of content in the environment in the world now. Therefore, let's make Facebook, let's make Google. You know, we didn't we didn't say Exxon Mobil, did we? You got to be proud that we have at least given huh. birth to one insane megalomaniac. I mean, I mean, you know, he's the thing that justifies our word. existence. <laughs> where, where? But. Here's what I, I guess the other, you know, I think. Guy, what I would say, go and read Sun Tzu, go and read Machiavelli, and don't use it to pass a test. It's not about a test. It's not, not different, actually, than what. what Keep Wolf, your uh, what, friends close and your enemies closer. But, uh, <laughs> what, what, if, if you have to build it to feel it and to experience it, so reading those things isn't a matter of of education in an academic way. I mean, to the extent that you understand those things, I think you understand something which is int intrinsic to the structure that you're working with. It doesn't only belong to architecture, you know. It might belong to art or to politics or to music, to a lot of things where people who have unusual things to offer have difficulties. In some cases, they, they can't do it at all. I think the... Uh you have to be ready to fail, I think. I you think have to if be we ready to or... get crushed. No, no, I think if we taught you <laughs> effectively to win these arguments, the arguments would just get tougher. You know, I just, there's never going to be a point where we know how to, you know, we've talked the world into listening to Charles Ives every day. You know, or built like every building is Wolf That was Prick. a guy who never saw his work performed. Um, I that's think right. he listened on the radio. He, uh, his, he's never, and he, he sold insurance. He was a great insurance salesman. Um, but here's what my point to you is, how does it work? Um, we teach, we are hysterically attentive to small architectural effects as if they're huge. That's what we are. We are the audience. So we look at a cantilever and we go, oh my God, or we go, oh, I'm so sick of cantilevers. You know, okay, I mean, I'm we- I'm so sick of glass. Yeah, we, I'm sick of glass. And, you know, we have big feelings about things in the world that are so trivial, virtually no one notices them. But- well, wait a minute, hang, let why me are they trivial? Hang on, let me finish. But they, they do- They matter to you. They matter to me, and I want them to matter to more people, but I know that's not going to happen. But is happen. that what makes them matter? No. What makes them matter, here's the story I want to tell. When I was in, you know, in the 20s, and I would go to movies, and I was listening to contemporary composers at the time, Ligeti and all those people. And, uh, and Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga, you know, just, uh, <laughs> and I would go, and everything would be Tchaikovsky. Mitt everything Romney. you would hear no, would be romantic music in a movie. <laughs> and, if you, and you would go to a concert, and they'd play Charles Ives, or Ligeti, or Warren, or anybody. And people would boo and walk out. Now you can't hear a movie without a contemporary score, and it's everywhere. And you it's see, it, there, is, there is there is the move from avant-garde to mainstream. Yes, there is the that same move, as but when, it's incremental. You know, Mahler was mainstream, and in the in the in the 1940s, every movie was underscored by by these new radical moves and moods. And and I think that I would say the same applies for what we're to talking about. I mean, the, 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 there's a kind of temporary condition. Where, where there's a kind of minority who's, who sees potential, who's, who gets excited. But I think it's a fetishism not to ask whether this translate uh, uh, can expand and can mean something advantageous and congenial to the overall progress of civilization, which I believe some of these new techniques, values, ways of working, ways of uh, uh, allowing the complexity of society to, 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 to come into architecture and out of architecture and be brought forward, it will be, uh, it will be um, um, what carries that civilization forward. And I think every single building will be uh, influenced and be, be forced to, to pick up that new global best practice because every single building in the end is designed um, um, by an architect who is brought up and uh, in a new culture and a new discourse. And for instance, um, there, there are these dogmas and taboos in the end which, which make a difference, which make an impact. And, um, and I think when you get excited about 
certain ideas and you've been super exciting inspiration in, in my uh, growth as an architect. It's because I saw the light that this really means something profound and powerful for, for urbanism, architecture on, on all scales uh, everywhere. Um, of course, these are, these are principles and, and, and I don't think they're kind of um, simple, banal recipes and sterile. They're, they're, they're kind of self-expanding principles. So. And, but, I mean... And I remain excited about them, but I, I, but I remain exciting about them because I know that we can win over important clients. So, for instance, when, when we went out in Singapore, Istanbul, uh, uh, Bilbao with, 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 with radical uh, master plans, which seem, would have seemed outrageous and, and different and, and extreme, but one can kind of present the advantages, the rationality, uh, the openness and, and, and constant sensitivity of these ways of working, you win suddenly. You can win these kind of competitions. And I, and I think that um, although there are corners of backwardness and, 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 and bureaucrats which might get in the way, I do, do believe it's not good for us to kind of um, um, self-pity us, uh, that we are kind of misunderstood in, 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 in a kind of insensitive world. I think we do have the, should have the conviction and, and capacity to win over, convince, uh, and, and it's up to us to, to, to yeah. make these things convincing, and I think we can. Um, but I will say, I mean, you were asking, I mean, he was asking what we don't teach and all that, and I will say, the truth is, I don't think you can teach that. That, that it changed. It's never, it's not a fixed thing. What it keeps changing. So to me, you, you need to educate the imagination because at the end of the day, is look, nobody thinks themselves as conservatives, even the most cons well, said in politics. But in the architectural world, most of the architects don't think of themselves as conservative. If you ask anybody, they all think they are somehow progressive. But it's a lack of foundation. It's a lack of how you understand. So. I don't know, there was this thing I was reading the other day, which is kind of interesting, that fundamentalism is theology without imagination. And the weird thing is, when they come to architecture, it almost like it reverse, because it seems to me that the avant-garde seems to be like the fundamentalism, but it's the one that's trading on imagination. So, honestly, I don't think you can teach that and you can learn it. I think, because I, in my experience of the different, over the years, having dinner with Wolf or with Eric or with Tom or Saha, Frank, you name it, you ask all of them, how they work, does it work? And they all will tell you the same thing. I don't know how I made it happen because if you ask them four years ago, the problems were one and the variables were one. Now they're different. So I don't think you can teach or not. What you can do is prepare and understand that that will happen. It's like telling your kids, don't do drugs, don't do this, and so on. How is it going to happen? I, I don't know. It's a tricky thing. I think anybody who will claim, and this is always the part that I admire about Patrick, that he's always so optimistic about having the solution for it. And I want to believe him, um, but, I, well, but look, I, I'm always an example. For instance, I'm the creation not, I, I, of Chicago, uh, the 1960s Chicago, isn't that an amazing extrapolation of, 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 of a moment uh, 30 years earlier? Yeah. And then it exists as a kind of vibrant, fantastic place, city, new world. That should be our ambition. What is, what is yeah, our next Chicago in 1960? What is, what is the kind of... Um... Anyway, any other questions? Uh, one thing I can tell you, students, is uh, I, can't, I can't help you with the bureaucrats, but I can teach you two secrets about how to always win with your client. And we'll do that in our next class together. <laughs> the, the, one, the one I can tell you is do not make apocalyptic skies. I give, I give you a... Just like Never. Romney. I give you a... I, give, I mean, he can tell you. I mean, yeah. apocalyptic sky doesn't work, right? But, uh, it's yeah. the bluest sky for Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious According about the secrets of Jeffrey. Uh, I'll, join you, I'll join you a studio because I want to know your secrets. <laughs> but no, no. I give you an example. I love him because he always brings example like the teeth yes. or the mungo and the snake and things like that. Uh, Jeff, a quick question: If you're a filmmaker, from basically from what I can um, understand from your 
position today, would you say that a very good screenplay and a very well-drawn artboard will equal, will equal a very well-made film? Uh, yes. You would? In, in the discipline. Huh. In the dis I, my, I, could, I could tell you film school interpretations of films that you, would, that you liked. I can, t I can make you hate films. I can make you hate Forrest Gump right now by, showing, by telling you the interpretation. Pick the a more difficult one. Yeah, I mean, that's what the fact... <laughs> The fact is, yes, I, I believe what you're saying is right. Because it's, it, people don't, when, they, when you go to a movie, uh, most people that go to a movie aren't in the audience of film. They're, they're going for entertainment, or they're just going. They you know, it's like they go, they see the movie, it lasts for a couple of hours after that, and that's it. There are certain people that have a hysterical attachment to it that every detail, every shot, uh, if you watch The Simpsons, you basically see the history of Citizen Kane's points of view told in cartoons for 20 years, so much so now that everybody around knows those points of view, which at one time were, when they, when they first pr produced the film, there was concern by the producers that no one would understand what it meant to be on, in the lights looking down at a body. Like, they just thought it would confuse the audience. We do retcon jump cuts today, in, without without a second's notice on TV in every show because of the Godard non-diegetic cuts. And so. that's why this was originally great. That's right. Because but you don't do it keep proves it. retrospectively you, you, you realize how great it was. But without that following, without that proliferation, it wasn't actually so great. So I believe in what succeeds is great. <coughs> I want to create yeah, but I mean, I, I, what I succeeds see for it. us guys is, the, is that they build. It. You guys. Yeah, build. but wait a minute. What do you mean? <laughs> what? what? You don't want to say what succeeds well, let's is do great. Movies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I used to say that. The what best. succeeds <laughs> is. I used to think that what the, succeeds may be empirically <laughs> so. It's our job no, to say whether it's great or not. For one time, I one time in my life I had a criteria that the best movies were the movies that were cost the most to, to, to make. And so I thought Waterworld was like the world's greatest movie. <laughs> Even though it sucked, I thought, they spent $200 million? I get to watch a $200 million movie for five Any bucks? Any other questions? <laughs> okay, um, I gotta go. should we call it a night? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, well, but really hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold <laughs> on. Tomorrow we have the last of the Patrick Schumacher Fest. Um, <laughs> We went from two hours and 45 minutes to two hours. Hopefully.